Welcome to Christ Community Church. My name is Neil Grogan. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're a guest, a visitor for the first time, I want to invite you to fill out one of our visitor cards. They're found in the seat back in front of you and also in the back table over there. If everybody orients their heads that direction, you'll find it. And hopefully in the hand of every hospitality uh, team member today. Uh, so there's plenty of places to find it. That's kind of the first step in, in getting to know one another, right? We learn who you are, how you got here, and, and one of the pastors will be reaching out to you um, to just learn more about your story from there. So I want to invite you to do that. You can place that in the black box on that back table. Uh, we don't pass a plate or anything, so that's where that will be found. Coming up on February the 20th is our next steps meeting. If you are, again, newer to the church and you've never been to one of this, one of these events, this is kind of where you learn who we are, what we're about, what we value as a church and what we believe. So I want to encourage you guys, if you've never done that, to maybe sign up for this Next Steps meeting. It'll go right after church. We'll eat lunch together, talk for a while, and then um, uh, send you on your way. Uh, you can reserve or RSVP to that by emailing office at Christ.community or by talking to either me or Pastor Stephen there in the back. If you never met Stephen, Stephen, raise your hand. That's Stephen. Okay. Um, we believe at Christ Community Church that giving is an act of worship. And so if you count this church as your church family and your home and you haven't thought yet about how to contribute to the mission of God that he has given us in our city and in the world, I want to invite you to give in addition to what the other ways you worship are, um, and you can do that in a, in a few ways. Again, there's that handy black box in the back corner of the sanctuary I keep talking about, but you can also go on our website. There's a, an icon you can select on giving, and it'll walk you through a digital process if that's more convenient uh, for you. Um, also, I have some really good news. We are starting a new, simmer down back there, no. We're starting a, a new community group. It'll be led by the Markhams, Jim Markham and the Walkers, Jeremiah in the back, those two gentlemen and their wives will be there as well. Um, we're starting this new community group where we um, get together eat, uh, every other week and, and work on applying the sermon text more uh, effectively into our lives specifically, but also where we do things like family worship. Our kids are invited to this, and we want to teach them that. Man, it is a normal thing in the life of a Christian home to read the Bible together, to pray together, and to sing praises to our King together. And so that happens there. We meet around the table, we break bread with one another, and we build strong ties with each other. So we currently have five CGs uh, that are kind of at capacity, so God and His grace has given us an opportunity to start another one uh, for number six. And so if you're not currently in a CG, I want to encourage you to sign up. They meet on Thursdays, or we'll be meeting this week on Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Walker's house. And uh, Jim and Kelly are uh, taking point on that team as well. So sign up, look for them. There's also a sign-up sheet at the front door. You can do that there as well. What do we believe about the way of salvation? Each week we've been going back over our confession of faith and talking about what we believe as a church, what unites us around the Bible. And so this is what we believe about the way of salvation. We believe that the salvation of sinners is by grace alone, through the substitutionary atoning work of the Son of God, who by the appointment of the Father freely took upon him our nature, yet without sin, honored by uh, the divine law by his personal obedience and by his death made a full atonement for our sins that having risen from the dead he is now enthroned in heaven and uniting in his wonderful person the tenderest sympathies with divine perfections he is every way qualified to be a suitable compassionate and all-sufficient savior Christ Community Church, all this means is that salvation is a work of God and not a work of ourselves. And that Christ in every way is sufficient for our salvation. So the call is to believe in the truth of Christ and what he has done on our behalf. Let's stand together and worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Revelation 7, 9 through 10. It says this. 
After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Let's worship. In tenderness he saw me, weary and sick with sin. And on his shoulders brought me. Fold again while angels in his presence sang until the courts of heaven rang. Oh, the love that saw me. Oh, the blood that bought me oh the grace that brought me to the fold oh god grace that brought me to the fold of god he died for me while i was sick needy and poor and blind to assure me I found you you are mine I never heard a sweeter voice it made my aching heart rejoice me to the fold of God. Upon His grace, upon His grace I'll daily ponder and sing anew His praise with all adoring wonder. His blessings I retrain. It seems as if eternal days are far too short to sing His praise. brought me to the fold of God. Who has held the ocean in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? and nations tremble at his voice. All 
all creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore Whenever the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting on his throne, Isaiah's response was, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst an unclean people. And that is the same response oftentimes when we behold our God and we see how good and holy and righteous he is, and we realize our own brokenness we can have that same response as Isaiah. It's good for us to have that same response as Isaiah. But what God has done in his great providence and his graciousness is he's given us the ability to confess our sins to him. So this morning, our verse of confession comes from Psalm 41, verse 4, where the psalmist said, I said, 
Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. Let's take the next few moments of our service to silently confess our sins to God. Colossians 1, verses 13 through 14. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness, and he has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for the one that you love. We praise your name for your Son, your beloved one, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that through his death and his resurrection, that we can have redemption from our sins, that the relationship that we had broken with you because of our thoughts, our words, our deeds can be restored through his work. We praise your name. Father, may this gratitude, may this praise, may the thought of this redemption drive us further in love with you. And we pray this In Jesus' name, amen. Now that our hearts have been prepared, we want to move into a time of what we call the Lord's Supper or communion. Whenever we do this, what we do as a church, as a body on a weekly basis is we have what we call a covenant renewal meal that you have a covenant. We have trusted in Jesus. We've repented of our sin. A covenant is made with God. But then on a weekly basis, we gather around this table to have a ceremonial meal of a little piece of bread, a little cup of of juice. And what that does is it reminds us and it renews the covenant that we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're a member here at Christ Community Church or not. We invite you to participate with us if Jesus is your King. However, if you don't know Christ or you're saying, you know what, I don't know about this Jesus thing yet. I'm still learning. I'm still exploring. Uh, What we ask is that when you come forward, just say, not today, pastor. We'll pray a prayer of blessing over you. This is a common thing, so it won't single you out. No one else will know about it. Uh, But the reason we ask that is because, once again, this is a covenant renewal meal. And so a covenant renewal has has to be preceded by the covenant. And so we just ask that if you're not at that point in your life yet, you just... You just wait, you pray, you explore, you find out why we lift our voices and our hands to this man who we believe is God and his name is Jesus Christ. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room. He took the bread, he blessed it and he broke it. He said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, then Jesus took up the cup He said, this cup represents my blood, blood which is shed for the forgiveness of many sins. He said, this is a new covenant I am making with you. And it's through the broken body, the spilt blood of Christ, that we can have redemption from our sins. It's why we can live in mercy and hope and freedom in this life. So Christ Community Church, as we come forward, I ask that you would eat and drink and thanksgiving.
Now's the time in our service where we get rid of, I mean, we escort the children. Oh, I got some looks um, out there for your class. Uh, your teachers are waiting for you. Good morning. Our passage today comes from Luke 15, verses 1 through 32. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have lost, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who don't need repentance. Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. He also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he had come to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to the the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son, who was, uh, sorry, now his older son was in the field and he came to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has brought him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fat calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ralph. Um, I want to encourage you guys to read the Bible out loud to one another. What uh, Ralph did um, just for us now is what, how the Bible is meant to be read. It's meant to be read uh, aloud, and it's a lost art in the lives of believers. So I just want to encourage you before we kick off a long chapter to read the Bible to one another. It is refreshing for the soul. Amen? Let us pray. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, kindly make us for your son's sake. Amen. 
In the year 384 AD, a man by the name of Augustine left his home, venturing off to Rome and Milan, searching out fame and fortune alongside his concubine. He was a man who was committed to seeking whatever produced in him the greatest possible pleasures, whether that be a pursuit of knowledge, a pursuit of fame and fortune, like I've already said, a pursuit of promiscuity. He, if it made him feel good, he was after it. And yet, some five years later, after him venturing off, he returned home, a broken and humbled man, now detesting all the worldly goals that he had so eagerly sought after at one point in his life. What was different about him was that he came home changed. He came home eternally affected by the mighty hand of God. In Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus gives this beautiful summary statement of his ministry when he says that the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. And in perhaps Jesus' most famous teachings here in Luke 15, the parable of the lost, we, he illustrates for us the purpose of this great work, the purpose of him seeking and saving It made me think about St. Augustine who wrote one of the most popular books in Christian history called Confessions where he attributed his life almost to being this prodigal type character himself. And what he realized was when he came home different, it was because he came home repentant. He had heard the gospel, he had responded to the gospel and it had changed the very disposition of his heart. He had been given a new heart. Like Psalm 51, 7 says, that the sacrifices that are pleasing to God are a broken and humble spirit. God will never despise that, the psalmist says. King David says. And what the parables of the lost teach us is how God effectually seeks and saves. But not only does he seek and save, but he also produces in us something that's not naturally found there. And that's a word called humility. And that's a word called joy. God restores humility and joy for the sake of his glory. So this morning, we're going to see how Jesus illustrates the ways God efficaciously pursues sinners. I told the kids in the first service I would explain that word because I know that's like a crazy word. Um, But I like adverbs and it made me happy to put it in there. So... How he efficaciously pursues sinners. Because this is an important thing to understand and grasp. But not only that, but how he sacrificially receives us when we come. And then how he unsparingly restores broken people. And what all of these things do, and all of these teachings of Jesus, these themes that come naturally from the text, they reflect, is the true love of Christ that is bent on seeking and saving the lost. So look with me at verses 1 through 10, and let's consider how God efficaciously pursues. Here's what it says. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When when he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Uh, That's ironic, right? Because we all need repentance. (laughs) We're made righteous by Christ, but we must all repent. So the irony here is clear. And he says, continues on in verse 8, Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep out the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her neighbors and her friends together saying, Rejoice with me because I have found the silver coin that I lost. 
I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. The context of Luke chapter 15 is not unlike many other moments in Jesus' teaching ministry. In the audience, Luke carefully tells us that there are two groups here at the setting. Group A consists of tax collectors and sinners. And their intent is to come and approach Christ to hear him teach. Do you see that in the text? Group B is the Pharisees and the scribes. But they have not come with the same intention. They have not come to hear Jesus teach, but to come to complain about the way that Jesus relates and deals with sinners and tax collectors. You see, these shepherds of Israel, which is what the Pharisees and scribes are, the shepherds of Israel, they have missed completely what they've been charged by God to do. In Ezekiel 34, if you want to write it in the margin of your Bible here, God gives us a clear picture of what these shepherds of Israel's hearts have been ensnared by. The, a clear picture of what's corrupted them. Here's what it says in verses 2 through 5 of Ezekiel 34. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? You eat the fat, wear the wool, and butcher the fatted animals, but you do not tend the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays, or sought after the lost. Instead, you've ruled them by violence and cruelty. And they were scattered for a lack of a shepherd, a lack of a faithful man. And they became food for all the wild animals when they were scattered. You see, the religious leaders of the day had lost perspective on what their mission was to care for the sheep of Israel. And even today, this is such a common issue. Pastors all over the place live off the fat of the sheep. They enjoy the warmth of the wool provided to them, but they fail to care for their people. Let it never be said of the pastors of this church. They don't smell like the sheep because they don't know them. They don't spend time with them. They don't know the people God has entrusted to them. And this is what happens when we lose sight of our purpose. And we seek to feed the beast inside of us selfishly. Each and every one of us. Fathers in the room. You are called to be the shepherd of your home. You're called to be the shepherd of your family. You're called to shepherd them to the pastures of God. How specifically are you doing this? How are you forming yourself into the likeness of Christ as well as your wife and your children? How do you set out each day to accomplish this work you've been called by God to do? Mothers in the room, you're called by God to nurture and care for your children. How are you shepherding their hearts, not just their behaviors? Are you so concerned about whether or not your kid obeys in public or do you care on a deeper level for where their hearts are and if they understand the gospel by which they are saved or not? That is shepherding. And we are all called to an aspect of this. If you're not a mother or father, listen, friend, dear Christian, you are called by God, commanded by God to submit to the good shepherd. What areas of your heart do you resist him in? Where is there rebellion? And the call is to repent. So Jesus gives us several beautiful examples of what this is supposed to look like. What the good shepherd is supposed to look like. And in so doing, he fulfills the rest of Ezekiel 34. Further on in verses 11 through 16 of Ezekiel 34, it says this. For this is what the Lord God says. See, I myself, this is God talking. I myself 
will search for my flock and look for them. As a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among the scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they've been scattered on the day of clouds and total darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the land. And I will tend them in good pasture, and their grazing place will be on the Israel's lofty mountains. And there they will lie down in a good grazing place, and they will feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of Lord God. Listen to this. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them (laughs) with justice. This is the lesson that Jesus sets out to teach here in Luke 15. Compassion and a call of repentance to sinners, but a relentless pursuit of his scattered sheep. This is the overarching theme of of these parables. And in the first two parables, Jesus illustrates the heavenly perspective for his effectual pursuit of the lost. The shepherd leaves the righteous to find the lost. And the result is great joy in heaven for one sinner who repents. That's the heart of heaven when we repent. Or a woman who tears her house apart to find the money she lost. And when she finds it, Jesus is quick to point out that the angels, the heavenly host, celebrate when a sinner repents. When the lost is now found. There is joy in heaven over repentance and salvation because a person who repents glorifies God. If you are a believer in the room and a follower of Christ, though you need to understand why I titled this point Efficaciously Pursues. And it is for this reason. Jesus teaches from these two parables that he finds what he searches for. Every time. There is no limit to his power. He does not limit himself. When he seeks, searches for something, he finds it for his namesake. There is not one sinner in heaven who just happened to arrive there magically, apart from God affectuously pursuing them. So if you're a follower of Christ in our sanctuary this morning, it's because God, with great effect, pursued you. And he found you. And he brought you back to the flock of God, which you belong, which you were created for. God is after his own glory. He finds what he seeks. And our heart for those who repent should be in accord with the heavens, right? We should, it should cause great joy in us when we see a sinner turn from their sin. Not grumbling and complaining, but joy. But not only that, God also calls you and I to bring this message of Christ to sinners. Something important just to note out from the the Gospels at large is we see Jesus sitting and dealing with sinners and tax collectors a lot, right? Everybody's nodding? Yes. All the time. But he never sits and builds relationships with them without purpose, does he? He is there and he always calls them to do two things. Repent and believe. And likewise, the example that Christ has given us is to build relationships with people that aren't like us. Who don't believe in these truths, but not to do so just for the sake of having more friends, but to do so with purpose. To go across the street, to reach across the alley, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are perishing. Because otherwise they will not know. We have been given the same charge that Christ has set out in his ministry to do. To seek and save the lost. Now we can save nothing. We talked about it this morning. That salvation belongs to God and God alone. But we are the vehicle by which he has chosen 
to proclaim his excellencies in the darkness. That is what we're called to do. But we have some aversion to being with people who aren't like us, who don't believe the same things as us. Like we're allergic to people or something. That's a reflection of pride, right? And so, and, I, and I'm guilty of this too. <laughs> yeah, the, the biggest evidence of my guilt is when I get on a plane to go across the country for work. I get on this plane, and most of the time I put these things in my ears, and I go like, please God, don't let anyone talk to me. <laughs> right? Because you get on a plane, and they go like, what do you do? What do you do? Right? So what do I say? I'm a pastor. And then in that moment, they either hate me or want all their questions answered. I don't know all the answers. You know what I mean? But it's going to be a long conversation, right? So I'll put on that that, uh, disgruntled veteran face, you know? You know what I'm talking about, veterans in the room? Mike's got his hand in the back. Like, don't talk to me. I'm unapproachable. But we often do that, right? We put on this face that says, don't approach me. I have nothing of worth to give you. The truth is, dear friends, believers, you have the greatest treasure in the universe to give. But we cowardly recoil often from giving it to others. Because what would they think? Right? But this is Christ's heart for the lost. And this should be ours. As well. Let us not be like these fat Pharisees who complain about people engaging the lost, but let us pursue our neighbors and one another for the glory of God. James 5.19 says that when we see a brother or sister in Christ going off into sin, that it's a it's blessed if we can turn them back. And Christians do that with Christians. Our hearts deceive us, right? So we have an opportunity not only to care for other people who aren't in this fold, but to care for one another as well. Pay close attention to one another's hearts and lives and call them to righteousness as Christ calls you. Church, God efficaciously pursues the lost. He finds what he searches for. But when they come home, Jesus teaches us that he will sacrificially receive them. Let's look at verses 11 through 20. Now, here's what it says. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. And so he distributed the assets to them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country. Everybody say severe famine. Put that nugget in the deep parts of your heart. I know it might not make sense yet. It will later. Verse 14. And after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country. And he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one would give him anything. (laughs) And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him. This parable is popularly known as the prodigal son parable. Have y'all heard this before? Probably so, right? Saw it on a felt board at one point in your life, hopefully. You haven't lived in Christendom until you've had a felt board, I'll tell you that. The word, the word prodigal means recklessly spendthrift. 
What that means is that you spend till you have nothing left. Tim Keller makes the case, and I think he's right, that this story is in fact not about these two sons, but about our prodigal God. Now, of course, God cannot spend till he has nothing left, right? He is infinite in all his attributes and in all that he has. That's what makes him God. But it's in the way that he deals with rebels and his enemies that we see this reckless abandonment. Or like this story says, one son who wishes his dad dead and another son who only cares about being honored among men. It's in the way he deals with sinners where we see Jesus' great sacrifice over and over again. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed this message of reconciliation to us. The sinner who is forgiven is forgiven on the grounds of Christ's sacrifice. Christ's death. And it's the cross that illustrates for us that reconciliation has been made possible by God and God alone. And we, but we don't just like magically arrive at the cross, right? More often than not, we're mostly ignorant of the disposition of our own hearts. We don't really get it. The reality is, church, most of the time, God has to break us to save us. And the young son, wishing his father dead, retrieves his inheritance and goes outside of the father's sight so that he can send to his heart's content, right? And it, but look at verse 14. The text doesn't say he spends everything and then he goes home, does it? No. The text says a severe famine struck that country. Church, I don't believe Christ ever wasted a word. A famine or any natural disaster or natural circumstance is something outside of our control, right? We cannot cause famines to exist. We cannot cause hurricanes to occur, right? None of that happens with our control. They are controlled ultimately alone by God. But it is the very tool in this passage of Scripture that God uses to bring this one sinner home. Isn't it beautiful? And most of the time we look at the severe famines in our lives. I don't know what it is for you as this horrible hardship. Instead of thanking God for bringing us to this pasture. We complain the way to the pasture, right? <laughs> All the way. We grumble. These famines are controlled alone by God, but it's the very tool that God uses often to bring us home. And for the younger son, he had nothing to eat to the point of starvation, where he would resolve, right? He would long to eat the food of the pigs. This morning, uh, Pastor Stephen and I and Russell Porterfield, we were talking in the foyer. Um, if something you don't know about your pastors is we all raised pigs um, as children <laughs> in the FFA. And I can tell you, um, based on what I know about my old pig, Moo, rest in peace, um, she made someone happy. I'll tell you that, Mr. Wayne. So those pens are gross, okay? It rains. You got to put these rubber boots on up to your knees, right? Because you'll get not delightful things upon your clothes, okay, that smell and follow you the rest of the day. And I used to go and have to clean these pens, and I just remember being like, man, this is nasty. So I was really excited when it was time to take her to market, um, in other words. And poor Moo went and made someone really happy. But nonetheless, right, I cannot fathom longing to eat her food. That's the kind of starvation we're talking about. That's not even to mention the fact that we're talking to Jews about Jews, right? Like, I can just hear the gasps in the crowd as Jesus gives this illustration. How controversial it would have been. But the point he's trying to make, church, is that the weight of our sin is crushing. 
But it's the pride in our hearts that will always keep us from repenting. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but I know this, that God's heavy hand, when it's on you, it may feel crushing. But what you need to know is that when his heavy hand is on you, it's close to you. And it's to bring you home. It has purpose. It's not for not. It's not to hurt. It's not to maim. It's to bring home. Numbers 32, 23 says that we can be sure. So the Bible says you can be sure of this principle. Your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. Let us resolve today not to let our sin just find us out. To be caught. But to bring our sin to the feet of Christ. To the cross. As soon as God makes us aware of it. When he crushes us. We have a direction to go. Let us run to Jesus. When the son comes to his senses, right? It says, the text says, he formulates this plan, essentially. He says, Jesus says, he says that, I'll go to my father, and I'll say, I've sinned against God or heaven, and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So remember, this is his plan. Make me like one of your hired servants. And then we get verse 20, this beautiful depiction of God's heart for the sinner who comes home. The text says that he is moved by compassion and runs to his son. Now this is also not, this is another controversial statement because old Jewish men don't run to nobody. Okay, it's shameful. Because you would have to because you wear these long man dresses and you'd have to hike them up and waddle out there, right? Like as quick as you can. Just on a side note, in Ephesians 6, when it says gird up your loins, that's what it means. Pull your man dress up and run, okay? Uh, See, it's not that boring, the Bible, right? So this is what the Father does. He's moved by compassion, a conviction to show mercy, and he runs to his son. And his son says, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't finish the rest of his plan, does he? He never gets to make me one of your hired workers. Why? Because the Father interrupts him. When we confess and repent, God sacrificially receives us. Like 2 Corinthians 5.19, he does not hold our transgressions against us, but begins to unsparingly. Restore the broken. Let's look at verses 21 through 32. As God unsparingly restores this this son. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Let's party. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. And so they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. And he was told that your brother is here and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became what? Angry. He became angry. And he didn't want to go in. Pay attention to this. So the father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you and I've never disobeyed one of your orders. Yet you never even gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice 
because this brother of yours was dead and now he is alive again. And he was lost, but now is found. The lesson that Christ is teaching us about the heart of God is that he delights in restoring broken people. The restoration of the younger son, he was restored into full sonship again. Why? Not because he was worthy. Every Christian song on the radio, I feel like, says, you're worthy this, you're worthy that. It's not true. We're sinners. We're not worthy of nothing but wrath. That's the reality. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We will see less of who God is when we see more of who we are. We're not. We're not worthy. We're sinners. He restores, not because we are worthy, but because it glorifies him to turn our hearts to repentance, to change us. And the heart of heaven over this is one of joy. So God restores people because he is the God of restoration and joy. It naturally flows from him. He is the source, the very cause of this heavenly joy. And we can have this kind of joy too when we have Christ. That's why the, uh, David says in the Psalms, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He goes to the source. He doesn't look to the world or look to other things. Give me this thing I'm lacking. No, he goes to who is the cause of joy. And that is God. And this is what the older brother misses. He misses the joy of a son, a brother, returning, who they assumed was dead, who is now alive. His brother misses this reality, and he misses the father. So concerned with validation, he misses the relationship. And even so, the father still entreats the older son just like the other. He still goes out to the older son. Same same heart for, this, for a different sin. He goes to the younger son in compassion. He comes to the older son in compassion. And I don't know where your hearts are this morning, but I, what I know is that I've been guilty of being both of these sons. Being a man who would waste it all. One of the greatest shames of my life, church, is... The way I lived as a Christian while in the service. It's my hope. It's my, why I felt called to this place in the first place. To warn people against that life. You can be faithful in your workplace. I was not when I was in the service. I was a prodigal. But I've also been guilty of being the older son. Standing on self-righteousness based on things I know in my head but don't know in my heart. And God come, came to me either way. and He exposed me and he restored me. And he will unsparingly restore you too. Last week, Pastor Stephen showed us this pie graph. It's the only time I've seen math work in church, right? <laughs> Other than a members meeting. There's a pie graph concerning how most people spend their times. And he asked us the question whether we had counted the cost of our time to follow Christ. And if you're like me, you found that convicting, right? Because I, I know what my pie graph looks like, and I can tell you it needs more blue. It needs more Jesus saturation across the whole thing. I was convicted about that, and I asked myself the question, have I really counted the cost? What sin did it expose in you? Formation into the likeness of Christ, church, must be something that we engage in. We can neither neglect or expect it to happen without us actively engaging. If you want joy, you must pursue the God of joy. If you want peace, you must pursue the God of peace. If you want to be gentle in your relationship with your spouse, you must pursue the God of gentleness. If you want to be gracious with those in your workplace who you loathe, you must pursue the God of grace. 
You must go to the source. Jeremiah Burroughs, this Puritan, once said that the most contented person in the world is the most dissatisfied person in the world. What he meant by that is this, that as children of God, we must pursue to know God endlessly. And as we pursue him, church, we will find him. And when we find him, we will be given the shalom, the restoration and peace he promises to give without sparing anything. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Father, let us not think of you as one who is far off. Let us not think of you as severe judge since you yourself come to us and fall in the necks of your poor prodigals and give us the kiss of peace. Lord, you will not let those of us go empty who come from you from afar. Lord, we come to you from afar, the far off land of our sins and our miseries, but you have brought us home. So help us, O oh God, to pursue you as you pursue us. Help us to receive others like you have received us. And help us to restore in grace as you, as you have restored us by your grace. For the sake of your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me White as snow, no other fountain, I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this I plead, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, God of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood.
first service, I kicked the dog out of this table. I thought I broke it. It's like, Cameron, come fix your table, man. All right, for our benediction, Christ Community Church, as God has pursued you and made you new, go pursue the lost for his namesake and for his glory. You're dismissed.